It is a random Friday night for me. I've got my tea here with me, so feel free to grab a beverage, make yourself cozy, do all the things because we're gonna talk about world building. I have so much stuff that I want to talk to you about in this video, but I think we need to establish what is world building first for somebody that may be stumbling upon this video that has absolutely no idea what I'm talking about. This video is going to be for occultists, for witches, for heathens, for whatever type of magical practitioner you are. If you are someone that is interested in the occult or interested into esoteric traditions and witchcraft, this idea of world building is something that you can do on the astral plane and it's something that you can do in your spell work to really take your magic to the next level. And what I'm about to share in this video is all based on my personal gnosis. I want to be very upfront about that, that this is something that I have discovered for myself. I did not read these things in any books, though I am sure that these exercises are, I'm sure they exist somewhere in some books across many, many traditions. I am not the only person that does this, but I want to express that what I'm about to explain in this video is based heavily on my own personal experience as a chaos magician, as a psychic, as a witch who meditates a lot as someone who works with spirits and all that stuff. World building is this idea of building a world inside your mind and some people call that world their mind palace, some people call it their inner temple. I prefer the term mind palace because I just like it but you can honestly call it whatever you want. Again this idea has many different names across many different cultures. So for the duration of this video I'm going to be talking about world building with your mind palace and how it pertains to an occult practice or a witchcraft practice, how you can use it to do shadow workings, how you can use it to do magic in your mind for free with no tools or anything. You can be anywhere at any time doing spells in your head. And you may have heard me talk about this term before, world building. If you've been on my channel for a while, you've likely heard that term a lot. <laughs> I've definitely explained my processes in a lot of other videos, but I get, I get these questions all the time in the comments and I think it's time for me to finally sit down and actually make a video about this. So if you have been on my channel for a while, some of these ideas are going to be very redundant. It's going to be the same things that I've said in previous videos, just all compiled into one place. But I do have a lot of other things that are going to be said in this video that I have not shared in other videos. So even if you have been here for a while, there's going to be a lot of tips and tricks and techniques in this video that are new for you, at least from this channel, at least. I don't know, who knows, maybe you heard about it from somebody else. And I wanted to share this because I feel like this is where you really tip your spell work from that beginner level to more intermediate advanced. This is my own personal opinion, but when you start to get into world building, it really does elevate your magical practice in my own personal experience. The stuff that you can do in your own mind palace is pretty incredible. I do want to put a quick note here for the non-visualizers, the people who don't enjoy visualization. Though world building is heavily based on visualization, there's my dog in the background, it is really based on doing a lot of visualization in your own mind. If that is not something that appeals to you, first of all, you definitely don't have to do world building, but second of all, there are alternatives. I have heard of many people painting pictures, creating computer graphics, uh, going about things in a non-visualization way and getting more creative in the physical world to represent your mind palace or your inner temple. For example, I think Megan Black at Round the Cauldron did a video that was really, really interesting. She showed her mind palace, her inner temple. I think she calls it an inner temple, but she did it on a Sims game. She actually created her whole inner temple inside a Sims game. So I'm going to find that video from her channel and I'm going to link it in the description box if you want to check that out. So though, like I said, typically visualization is the method that you would do for everything that we're going to be talking about later on in this video, there are alternatives to that. Feel free to get creative and you can create it in the physical world if you don't enjoy visualization or for someone that just can't visualize, period. So let's talk about some of the reasons why you might want to do some world building, why you might want to create an inner temple or a mind palace. What is the point of all this? What's the purpose? So as I mentioned previously, I really do feel like this can take your magic to the next level. You can use your mind palace, which I will explain a little bit later in this video, in spell work as a psychological trigger. So if you've ever had those moments where you need to do a spell really, really quick, but you have a hard time getting in the mood, you have a hard time getting into an altered state of consciousness because you really need to sink into that, right? You need to descend into an altered state of consciousness or at least be in the right mindset.
mindset before you do any sort of ritual or any sort of spell work. And world building, having a mind palace or an inner temple is really helpful because you can sink into that place and use it as a psychological trigger to get to that perfect mindset like that very, very quickly and efficiently. You can also use your inner temple or your mind palace to enter the astral world a little bit easier. So if you're looking to go on astral trips, if you're wanting to talk to your ancestors, your spirit guides, your gods, your goddesses, whoever it is that you are wanting to commune with in the astral realm, having some sort of mind palace or inner temple as a go-between place, a safe space in the astral realm for you to meet your guides is really helpful as well. I would argue that there are parts of the inner temple that are not necessarily in the astral realm and parts of the inner temple that are in the astral realm and we'll also go deeper into that later in this video. Some of it I feel like takes place in your mind, some of it takes place a little bit beyond your mind, but then technically we could argue it's all in your mind and external things can meet you inside your mind. So whether it's in your mind or not, I digress, we'll get into that conversation later. You can also have your mind palace as a place where spirits can reside. So for example, I have a power animal, we're gonna talk about this a little bit later too, but I have a power animal that resides at my mind palace and I also have servitors that live there so there's so many different types of entities that you could have hanging out in your mind palace and when you're ready to work with them you simply go to the palace and pick them up. And again, as I mentioned previously, it's just a great place to receive messages from any sort of spirit guides that you may potentially be working with. You can work with archetypes, you can do shadow work in your mind palace. And again, as I mentioned in the beginning, you can do free magic. You can do spell work in your mind without having to do really anything in the physical realm if you don't want to. If you don't have any tools, you can literally sit down on the ground, go into your mind palace and cast a spell with nothing but yourself. It's also a very low energy practice. So if you are one of those people that really struggles with your energy levels, this is something that I struggle with quite a bit. You can be laying in bed or laying in a bubble bath and you can be doing this mind palace work while you're in those states. I think it's also great for people who struggle with sleep. So if you're someone that really struggles to get to sleep at night and you're laying in bed for hours and hours on end just staring at the ceiling, I know that that's something that I struggle with. Working on your mind palace or your inner temple in those moments when you're laying in bed staring up at the ceiling, A, it's low energy effort and B, it kind of does lull you to sleep a little bit. And in regards to how low effort this practice actually is, you can work on your mind palace in lucid dreams. So it's very, very versatile. I feel like anybody can do it with any level of energy. So now that I've kind of defined what world building is and what a mind palace is and why you should care, why you should do it, why you should build your own inner temple. I wanna talk about all the ways that I personally perform world building. And in order to do that, I'm gonna kind of take you on a tour of my own own personal mind palace and hopefully in doing that you can take some inspiration and do whatever you want with ultimately at the end of the day it's your mind palace and you can do whatever the hell you want to do in your own palace when I walk into my space I am the king of the castle literally so you can create different doors that lead to different rooms inside your mind for whatever suits your purpose but I wrote down a list of all the things that I kind of wanted to touch on because there's a bunch of different components to my mind palace so I'm gonna talk about how to build the main rooms the main rooms of your castle or cottage or whatever it ends up being. I'm going to talk about the closet. I'm going to talk about the memory room, the spirits that live there, the garden, and then Wonderland. <laughs> so feel free to use the timestamps below on this video if you want to. But those are all the categories of my inner temple that we're going to be discussing. So let's start with the main rooms. When you are building the main rooms in your house or your palace or whatever it is, first of all, you kind of want to find some sort of model that works for you. For me, my inner temple is this giant god gothic castle. It has long winding stairs that lead up to different doors that go into different rooms and it's endless and it's beautiful. And when I walk into it, as I said previously, I am the king of this castle. Some people prefer to have a cottage in the woods. Some people prefer not to really have any structure whatsoever and they just want a big meadow or a big forest or whatever that is for you. In the past, I've had a mind palace where I didn't necessarily have any house per se. I've had a temple before where I would go in and do work and then I also had a forest where every tree in the forest had a door on it and then inside the door each tree was its own separate room for a very specific purpose. 
So you could have it set up like that. You're walking in a forest and all the trees have doors on them and each tree leads to a different space. You can even be as detailed as you want, picking very specific species of trees that have specific energies that pertain to rooms that they hold. So feel free to do whatever you want there. But for right now, what I'm currently working with is this big, beautiful Gothic castle. And in order to get to my Gothic castle, I should probably back up for a second before we go into all the main rooms. But really, you're gonna wanna have some sort of knowledge of meditation beforehand, right? Like, this video isn't really gonna be a meditation 101 video. I, I really need to do that, though. I really need to do a full guide to brainwave states for the occultist. I do have that planned. I do, I just haven't gotten to that video. So you're gonna wanna know basically how to get into an altered state of consciousness. Kind of relaxing yourself, you can take 10 slow deep breaths, you can do a body scan, you can do a different type of visualization, whatever it is that helps you descend down into an alpha brainwave state. And if you're not familiar with that term, that's fine. Just find something that's gonna be relaxing to you, close your eyes, and then you're gonna begin visualizing whatever your mind palace is gonna look like. So after you've figured out, okay, it's a palace, it's a cottage, it's a forest, whatever it is, then you can start building from there. But the main rooms is typically what I recommend starting with first. So each room contains a very specific energy or essence or intention. And you really wanna be intentional about what types of energy you are wanting to use in your mind palace. So for example, I have one main room that is dedicated purely to power and passion. I feel like this type of room is so good for people that really struggle with self-esteem or people who are really have a hard time taking up space. That was something I used to struggle with a lot, not so much anymore after doing this kind of work, but that is something I really struggled with was taking up space. And I really wanted a room to make me feel immensely powerful and passionate. I really wanted it to connect me to my passion. So I visualized one door, you know, you're walking in the Gothic castle for me, you're going up the winding staircase and there is the first door. I painted the door red because red is the color of passion and power. That's the color that I personally relate to those intentions. So you can spend some time painting the door, picking the perfect doorknob, whatever it is that you want to do there. And upon opening that door, you can create this room to be whatever you want it to be. What makes you feel, in this case, very powerful and very passionate? For me, I'm painting the walls red as well. Everything is going to have a red crimson color to it. With my power room, when I'm walking into it, I also have wings on my back. So you can be wearing any outfit when you're in the room. You can be any creature when you're in the room and it doesn't even have to be a room either it can be a door that leads to a completely different landscape maybe you have a room where you open the door and all of a sudden you're at a beach or you're in a desert or whatever it is so you don't have to be confined to four walls here you can really make it what you want it to be but you want to spend some time you know painting the walls picking the scenery hanging up shelves putting knickknacks on the shelves and thinking about all the things that make you feel immensely powerful or in whatever your intention is. If you have a different type of room, maybe a peaceful room for somebody who is very anxious, somebody you know who struggles with anxiety, having a peace room would be really helpful for that where you can just go into that peaceful room. Maybe you paint it blue or something, or maybe you're someone that struggles with depression. You want a happy, joyous room, so you paint it yellow. You know, like do, do whatever you want. But in these main rooms, you're really creating all these different rooms for all these different intentions or purposes things that you really want to work on in life. I mean, you don't have to create rooms for every single intention that ever exists, but really just create rooms that you're actually going to use, things that you're actually working on. So when you're in spell work, this is kind of where psychological triggers come in, but when I'm, let's say, sitting down, let's take my power room again for an example. I'm sitting down to do spell work for increasing my personal power, or maybe I'm doing a passion spell because I want to increase the passion in my relationship or just my passion for life in general. I would do a couple deep breaths, go into that altered state of consciousness, and then I would visualize myself going into my mind palace, going into the Gothic castle, up the winding staircase, 
to the red door and then I would open the red door and now I am in my power room and this is where I will mentally be when I'm doing that spell work. And so like I said beforehand with these psychological triggers, the more times you do this, the more effective it becomes and the quicker the process is. The first couple times you do this, it may feel like, oh my gosh, I don't wanna have to walk up the stairs every time and go find the red door and open the door and whatever, but it really does become a very, very fast process after repetition, after you've been doing this for a while. So now I can sit down, take a few deep breaths, get myself into an altered state of consciousness, go straight to the red room and boom, I'm there. I feel immensely powerful. I feel immensely passionate. And that is the energy that I'm gonna be channeling into the working, the ritual, whatever it is I'm doing in my occult practice. So that's kind of an overview of the main rooms where you have different rooms for specific intentions that you can use in spell work. And again, you don't even have to use it in your physical spell work in your mundane world. You can simply just go into those rooms and do spell work in your own mind with whatever tools you want to. Now that we've got the main rooms established, let's talk about the closet because I have a closet and I think everybody should have a closet. It's kind of one of those coat closets where the moment you open the door to your mind palace, the closet is right there in front of you. And so I can open my front door and then just be standing in the entryway as I open the coat closet. And the coat closet is really where I store archetypes that I wanna work with. And I know that sounds really strange, so let me try to explain. So this kind of goes into pop culture magic, and I did a video a while ago where it was chaos magic and pop culture, where I talked about using characters, like fictional characters from books, TV shows, movies, just media in general, right? Using these fictional characters in your spell work. And I talked about how I have a closet where I go there and I look through the different outfits, AKA the different archetypes or the different characters that I wanna play. And let's say I want to be Moira Rose. Okay, I don't know if anybody's seen Schitt's Creek, but it's one of the funniest TV shows ever and I love that TV show so much. There's this character on there, Moira Rose, and she is so extra, like so, I just, I love her so much. So if I'm wanting to channel that Moira Rose energy, what I would do is I would go into my coat closet, I would find the outfit for Moira Rose, and I would put it on, metaphorically speaking, of course, because you're doing this through visualization, right? You're going to the closet, you're pulling out that outfit, you're literally assuming that archetype. You're putting on the clothes, you're doing your face makeup to literally change your face. You can even have a mirror in your coat closet so you can focus on changing what your face looks like and your hair and you know all of that stuff. You're transforming into this archetype and again it doesn't have to be pop culture it can be an archetype of any sort of archetype that you want to embody. Maybe you really want to embody some badass female warrior energy or something <laughs> you know you can have that archetypal energy that you're stepping into but the coat closet is there to put on these different outfits which are again great psychological triggers and spell work they just get you into the right mindset for whatever it is that you're trying to do. And you can even use this when you're out and about going through the motions of your day. If you're needing to feel more confident, if you're needing to feel more calm because you're starting to get pissed off at stupid people, whatever it is, you can pull out that archetypal energy whenever you need it, put it on, and that can be your form of spell work. Speaking of archetypes, let's talk about the memory room because I think that mind palace work or inner temple work can be really powerful uh, when it comes to shadow work. And I do have videos on shadow work if that's something that you're interested in. It's one of the very first videos that I ever did on this channel. So it is, the filming is awful. The filming is so bad, but I will link those videos down below. Just please don't judge me too harshly for those. But I, the first video is called What is Shadow Work? And it discusses Carl Jung's concept of working with the shadow. Although I really, really want to redo that video and expand upon it because I didn't even talk about archetypes in that video or anything, but I digress. It's a very basic beginner's 101 guide to shadow work. And then I have a second video um, that goes over book recommendations for shadow work. But essentially when you're working with your shadow, the darker parts of yourself, and really trying to bring those in union with the lighter parts of yourself, I think the Mind Palace is a great place to do that. And so the way that I, without getting too personal, the way that I incorporate shadow work into this is I have a room that I call the memory room. And when I go into that memory room, 
It can take me to any memory that I want to go to. And when I'm revisiting those memories, I can use that as reflection, as contemplation. I can even rewrite the endings of those memories so I can remember something that happened that was really difficult for me and I can kind of rewrite the story and really create the reality that I wish that I could have had. Or even just acknowledge those memories and realizing that they don't affect me any longer. You know, shadow work is so, so personal. One of the things that I love to do the most, although I wouldn't say love because I don't love shadow work. <laughs> I really, I don't know anybody that loves shadow work, but let me rephrase that and say the most effective thing that I do in my memory room is that is where I go to work with my inner child because a lot of shadow work is working with that inner child to see where those shadows developed in the first place in the, the nurture that you had with your primary caregivers, etc. And so when I go into that memory room, I visualize my Myself going to either a park or a meadow or something like that and I visualize myself walking up to a bench and on that bench there is a little child sitting there and as I walk up closer I realize that that little child is me and so I can sit down on that bench next to my inner child and have a conversation with them and the first couple times you do this your inner child might be pissed off they might not want to talk to you they might be crying you know whatever it happens to be but you can spend some time nurturing that child and playing with that child you can play games together you can hug them you can tell them that you are there for them especially if you're someone that struggles with abandonment issues just showing up for your inner child sitting on that park bench and saying I'm here for you I've got your back I'm not going anywhere you are not alone anymore and nobody else can hurt you because I won't let them I think that's something that's really powerful when you can sit down with your inner child and have these moments in your memory room where you're really creating that bond with whatever wounds may be going on in there so that's just kind of like a brief overview of how I use my mind palace to do shadow work Work. and again shadow work is like so personal right so you're gonna have to figure out what really works best for you okay so let's talk about some of the spirits that can live in your mind palace your inner temple because I find that this is such a great place to have uh, entities hang out that you like to work with on a regular basis so I have a power animal it is this animal that I acquired in my shamanic studies years ago and it was a really transformative experience even discovering what my power animal actually is maybe I shouldn't say years ago. I think it was maybe like two years ago now, three years ago, something like that. Anyways, the purpose of my power animal is to come with me on astral trips as a form of protection. I have this animal that comes along with me on every single astral trip that I do when I'm leaving my mind and going deeper into the astral realm and things are no longer in my control. Because in your mind palace, in your inner temple, you're still like kind of in your mind, right? Because you have control of your environment. You can build a wall, you can break down the wall. You can control everything that's around you. But once you go into a deeper altered state of consciousness and you start dipping into the astral realm a little bit more, one of the ways to know that you're astral projecting is you no longer have control over your external environment. You're not, you can't build a house anymore because you're not in your mind anymore. You are somewhere else. And so it's helpful to have guides, spirit guides that can come along with you when you're in the astral realm, just as some sort of protection. And so my power animal is an entity that comes along with me when I go on these astral trips outside of my mind palace, you know, well beyond that, just to kind of protect me and, you know, help help lead me back to the mind palace, etc. And side note about going into the astral realm, I think it's so helpful to use your inner temple because as you go deeper into your inner temple, you kind of go, at least for me at least, you kind of go deeper into an altered state of consciousness. And eventually, when we talk about Wonderland, uh, I'll get there, we'll get to Wonderland, you can use your inner temple to get you into the the astral realm. So anyways, I have a power animal that just kind of hangs out in front of my gothic castle and whenever it's time, I go into my meditation, I go to my gothic castle, I pick up my power animal and then off we go. We go to the astral realm together. I also have a lot of servitors that hang out around the gothic castle. So if you're someone that's interested in servitors, I'm not gonna do the whole spiel in this video. You can check out my servitor video. I have a total guide to servitors, what they are, how to create them, etc. I'll link it below in the description box. But these magical entities, I, I have a lot of them live in my mind palace for a while before I even bring them out into the external world. It's kind of like 
I have them sit in my mind palace for a little bit to get used to their new body, their new roles, their new whatever it is before I actually bring them out into the physical world. And it just, it works really well for me that way. That sounds really creepy having them get used to their bodies or whatever, but it works. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I had to stop recording for a little bit because I had to go eat dinner. Anyways, we're back. So I think we left off with spirits in the mind palace or the inner temple. So I kind of want to talk about the garden next. I have a garden. I recommend that everybody have a garden somewhere in their mind palace, inner temple, their forest, their meadow, whatever it is. Have somewhere where you can plant intentions, you can plant seeds, and you can water things and allow them to grow. There is a phrase that I learned in the heart of my Buddhist practices, and it was really about planting the seeds and watering. I, I'm really gonna butcher this because I can't remember the exact wording, but it was about planting seeds and watering the things that you want and not necessarily focusing on the things that you don't want. So having a garden where you can plant intentions into the soil or you can even work with plant allies here. Uh, one of the ways that I really like to connect with plant allies among many other physical means, but really in my mind, let's say I'm working with Rosemary for the first time, which Rosemary and I already have an amazing relationship. I use rosemary for so many different things but let's say I've never worked with rosemary before I'm working with rosemary in the physical world and then I'm also working with rosemary in the astral world so as I'm working with the plant in the physical world I am also planting rosemary in my garden I am watering rosemary every day I am waiting to receive any messages from rosemary and I'm really assessing how that plant makes me feel on an energetic level so you can definitely use your garden to connect with different plant spirits and really assess that that energy but you can also like I said you can use your garden to plant intentions so I think this is really helpful let's take depression for example someone who struggles with depression that was something that I definitely struggled with for the majority of my life planting seeds of joy pure joy that is not contained planting those seeds and watering joy in my garden every single day you can do a very very short meditation the moment that you wake up you go into your mind palace you go to your garden or your greenhouse or whatever it is and you watch the seed for joy and then that's all you have to do and then you do it again the next day and the next day until eventually your joy what you have planted in the garden is now a little sprout and then the sprout turns into a bigger plant with more leaves and then maybe it eventually turns into a giant cedar tree whatever it is that practice of planting and growing and watering these seeds every day can be really powerful for manifesting the things in your life that you want and again it's so easy it's so quick doing a meditation first thing in the morning going to your garden and watering your little joy plant. How fast and easy is that? And it's fun. It's fun. It's creative. I found it way more rewarding and enjoyable than having to sit down and write in my gratitude journal. Not gonna lie, okay, gratitude journals are great, especially if you're trying to find pockets of joy in your life, but I hated writing in my gratitude journals, and I found that working in the garden in my mind was just so much more effective. So anyways, have a garden, plant stuff in there, whatever you want, grow different trees, and it doesn't even have to be plants. You can grow creatures in your garden, okay? What about a cute little gnome? Maybe you plant a seed and then instead of a sprout, a gnome head pops out of the soil. Like get creative because it's your own world and you can do whatever you want. Lastly, I wanna talk about a place that I call Wonderland. And this is something I have always deeply resonated with Alice in Wonderland, I am Alice. Whenever I go on an astral trip, I am almost always Alice, just curiouser and curiouser. If you've been on my channel for a long time, you know that I have a deep connection to that archetype, Alice in Alice in Wonderland. So as I go into my Gothic castle, I go up the winding staircases. There is a long hallway with many and many doors that I have to pass to get to the end of this hallway. And at the very end of the hallway is a door that leads me to Wonderland. And and Wonderland is kind of this in-between space. I would say once I open that door and step in, I'm not necessarily fully in my mind anymore, but I'm also not fully in the astral realm either. I feel like it's a kind of in-between space. It's really difficult to describe, but in Wonderland, it can take me anywhere. So for example, I have my servitor workshop there because I still am kind of in my own mind. So that is where I go into the workshop to create servitors, to really build their physique, pick out their attributes. I'm literally in this workshop 
building them from scratch. And then once the servitors have been built, I bring them into my gothic castle and then they kind of like live in the castle for a little while, just getting accustomed to their new uh, body and attributes and all those things. Then I bring them out into the physical realm. There's a whole process I have for servitors now. <laughs> but in Wonderland, I've got the shop, which is the first stop. And then beyond that, Wonderland can take me anywhere. It's a place where I have very little, the deeper I go into Wonderland, the less control I have of my external surroundings because I'm getting into a deeper trance the further that I travel away from my gothic castle, if that makes sense. So this is where you can go to the lower world to speak to your ancestors and to gain messages from them, etc. Or you can travel to an upper world if you want to speak to a god or goddess or whatever your perception is. Maybe you don't go to lower worlds or upper worlds or whatever, but if you want to commune with some sort of spirit guide for I'll take Thoth for an example. I will, if I want to commune with Thoth, what I typically do is I go to my gothic castle, I go up the steps, I go all the way down the hallway, I find the door for Wonderland, open the door, and then into Wonderland I go. And the deeper I go, the more I find myself in a desert of Egypt. And I find myself walking around the sandy desert, I can see pyramids, you can keep visualizing whatever correspondences pertain to the actual entity that it is that you're wanting to work with. And then I can go into a pyramid, I can kneel down in front of an altar and I can speak to Thoth in this space, bringing in as many sensory elements as possible. You know, it's going to be hot, it's going to be sticky, it's going to be humid <laughs> compared to where I live, right? Egypt is very, very hot, whereas here we have very mild temperatures and it's kind of a colder climate. So I want to bring in all these sensory things into this experience and, um, and I can potentially receive messages from Thoth in this state. So that is how you can kind of use your mind palace as a way to get deeper and deeper into altered states of consciousness without having to do like traditional meditation because I know so many people struggle with that, right? Because it's boring, they have a hard time clearing their mind. You know, some people will try to meditate and they think they just have to sit down with their back straight, with their legs crossed in a butterfly position or whatever, and then they just have to think of nothing for 20 minutes, for an hour, for however long, you definitely don't have to do that. If you don't enjoy sitting in silence and trying to shut all your thoughts off, you can do this method of visualization and walking through these different rooms to help you get deeper and deeper into a trance. You can kind of lull yourself there with all of these cues, all of these psychological triggers. I know that as I walk down the hallway, the really long hallway where Wonderland is at the very end of that hallway, I know that I'm relaxing each body part as I'm walking down the hallway. I'm getting deeper into theta, not quite to theta yet, but I'm transitioning from an alpha brainwave state to a theta brainwave state and just kind of going deeper and deeper into that trance. So I hope that gives you lots of ideas ideas and lots of inspiration for what you can do in your own palace. Definitely let me know your methods, your tips and tricks in the comments below. I'd love to get a little thread going where everybody can share their ideas and all that. If you found this video helpful and you want to support me because all of the funds from this YouTube channel goes towards my college tuition, feel free to leave a super thanks down below. It's kind of like a tip jar. Maybe consider becoming one of my channel members. There's a ton of perks that come with being a channel member. You get early access videos and planetary forecasts and monthly content polls. We're even doing a book club now so there's a lot of stuff that comes with that. I'll leave the link for that in the description box below as well. I appreciate all the support and thank you for watching. I'll see you in a video soon.